have two um, grounds for biblical divorce. And again, we're just underscoring the permanence of marriage and that both Jesus and Paul uh, set the, um, the tone and the ideal for the Christian community as redemption, reconciliation. So it's not that you must divorce, uh, but that you're, you're free to divorce, right? Right? Is that right? Got that right, Tony? Okay. <laughs> right? Um, and the word, the word in Matthew 19 in terms of, of sexual immorality is translated sexual immorality in English is porneia in Greek. And, of course, that is any sort of illicit uh, sexual activity uh, that breaks the bond, right? And... Um, so it's such a serious violation of the character and purpose of the marital bond, covenantal interdependency for the sake of in image bearing, that the offended partner may choose to recognize that reality with, with divorce. And then abandonment of the marital bond by an unbelieving spouse, such a serious violation of the character and purpose of marriage that the brother or sister is not enslaved. Now, of course, this... It's been debated a lot by New Testament scholars and by the church wrestling with the ethics of what is clearly a priority in Scripture about the permanence of the marital bond on the one hand, but also on the other hand about the seriousness of these violations of that, of that bond. And of course now we wrestle with, with things that we talk about like physical abuse, right, and, and, uh, and emotional abuse. Um, and as we've sort of studied how theologians have, have wrestled with these issues um, throughout our history, there's a principle in our tradition, in the Reformed tradition, uh, that comes out in the way the larger catechism talks about um, how God's law is to be observed and understood. What is a right understanding? So it's larger catechism question number 99. And one of the principles that comes out in our tradition is, uh, has to do with that under one sin or duty, all of the same kind are forbidden or commanded. Um, so that if it's the same effect, if it's the same kind of sin that produces the same kind of grievance, right, if the same thing would apply, it would be forbidden, right? Uh, and so... Uh, in the PCA, the denomination of the Presbyterian Church of America, uh, we had a study committee wrestle with some of these issues, both from the scriptures and in terms of our own tradition. And one of the principles that came out is that it seems fitting on the principle of larger question um, number 99 that other external actions such as physical or emotional abuse may be of such an extreme nature if they equate with the rupture caused by adultery or desertion. So you can certainly see in terms of sexual abuse that that fits with the definition of porneia and that physical abuse would cause such a sense of a violation of one's personal safety that you would need to, to leave, that it's a rupture of the, of the marital bond. Uh, so, again, uh, not any cause like what the Pharisees were asking Jesus in Matthew 19, only these two in particular, and then uh, those under this principle that would be the same kind of result, the same kind of rupture. And it really takes, I think, this is a good example of why shepherding and the wisdom of God's people walking with people through this crisis is so important because it's not clear cut. It really requires careful attention to each situation, each case, right? Personal intimate knowledge uh, by trusted leaders in the church of what's going on. So again, we've sort of come back to this issue of the importance of shepherding uh, during marital crisis the purpose and structure of, uh, of church discipline. So we come back, just a reminder, about the positive part of discipline. Sometimes when we um, 
talk about church discipline, we only think about it negatively, about the censures, about uh, sort of the admonition part, the tough part, the tough love part, which is very necessary. We also need to think about discipline, though, constructively, that the first part of discipline really has to do uh, with instruction and with care, just like in our families, right? Uh, so how do we bring about the obedience of our children? It's not merely by punishing them. That's, that's not how we bring about the, the discipline of our children, right? It's by loving them, by, by showing them proper examples, by living constructively and positively in front of them uh, that really is the beginning and the most important part of discipline. And if we have those kinds of relationships, those kinds of pastoral relationships, those kind of discipleship relationships, then when there's crisis, there is that relational capital so that then a censoring action, a, a admonition will have much greater force and a much greater uh, potential for success, right? So, like the family, discipline is for growth in character and positive instruction and encouraging examples is uh, where that begins. Let me just turn to one of these passages. We don't have time to read all of it, but turn with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Remember that Paul sent Timothy to a very difficult pastoral situation in Ephesus where there was a lot of quarreling, a lot of false teaching. And here's what he tells Timothy, verse 9 of chapter 4. The saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people. Paul keeps coming back to the gospel, doesn't he? He keeps coming back to our story. This is the story we're part of, especially those who believe. And here's his instruction. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your, for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Don't neglect your gifts, which were given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them so that all might see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching, persist in this. So the patience, the love, the endurance, the instruction, constructive, positive discipline, that's where uh, it all begins. That's where we're depositing in the bank all of the revenue, all of the capital that will then back us when we need to admonish, when we need to confront. So that's the beginning. And then, of course, there is, though, admonishment but with humility and patience. So if we turn to Matthew 18, that is, of course, a central text for us regarding church discipline. Let's just look at that for just a moment. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Uh, notice that the purpose is to regain your brother. That is the purpose. The purpose is not merely to sanction, uh, to admonish. And that comes out so clearly, doesn't it, in Galatians chapter 6. If you turn over to Galatians 6, notice Paul's warning even to us who are carrying out the discipline. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. Again, the goal of discipline is restoration, not punishment. And then he tells us how, in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
And Paul realizes we're all made out of the same stuff. Um, you know, so many times I was involved in pastoring and disciplining others, and then I was on the other side of that. I was involved in a process of accountability and discipline. And that's the way it is for our lives. We're all made out of the same stuff. We all need the gospel. And Paul's very aware of that, that as we pastor others, we do so with patience and humility, bearing one another's burdens to fulfill the law of Christ. Because if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Uh, so there's a time to admonish, to go to our brother and to say, something's not right here. This isn't wrong. I'm I'm concerned, and that's what my brothers and their wives did for us. They came to us. They admonished us. They confronted us. Uh, we're concerned for you. Here's what we see, right? And that's what the Lord would have us do, not sit back and not do anything, not get involved. That's easier for us not to get involved, but it's not love. It's not shepherding. It's not what we're called to do with our children. It's certainly not what we're called to do as leaders in, uh, in the Lord's church. So we go about it with patience. We go about it with love, building on the foundation of instruction and example and bearing with one another, but speaking the truth and admonishing uh, when there's an offense, when the principle of love has been violated. Um, censure. So... Remember in Matthew 18, there's this process, and it's a patient, sometimes lengthy process of going to your brother or sister and confronting them, taking one or two other brothers uh, to do that if they don't listen to you, right? And then, only then, we bring it to a more formal process in terms of the representatives of the church. And so if we go back to uh, this um, idea of shepherding where people are known by their small group leaders, they would be the ones who would hear and see things first. They would probably be the ones confronting first. They might take others in the group or they might take the, um, the shepherd, the woman shepherd who is over that woman small group leader to come and confront them and the second stage of Matthew 18, right? And there'd be patience. There'd be weeks. There'd be phone calls. There'd be getting together to pray and to talk and to listen, right? But then if there continues to be refusal and if, there, if there's a pattern of defection, right, then there would need to be a time to um, talk to the elders and to begin the process, right? And what's, what's interesting here, though, is if we remember Ezekiel 34 and John 10, is if you are sharing a sin, according to the pattern of Matthew 18, with someone who has loved you, someone who has been there for you, right? Then when they call you, when they approach you, that's very different than just sort of the representative of the office of elder, calling you or coming to you. Totally different things. If a father in the faith, if an older brother in the faith, right, is coming to you, that's a completely different thing than just someone who represents the office, right? And that's why we see that Paul is serious about this familial language. It's not just a symbol. It's not just a metaphor. He actually means brothers and sisters. That's the kind of context that we're called to cultivate. Um, so when we come to censure, there's in our book of church order, and I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't look in your book of church order. Peter, maybe you can help me here. But there's basically... Uh, three steps. There's formal admonition, there's suspension, and then there's excommunication in terms of the censure process. And um, we want to look at that and the reasons for that. Uh, we see here in terms of um, formal admonition that Matthew 18, the second part of that, that it needs to be sort of told to the church leaders. 
uh, that's then they admonish you, and that promise that begins, right? Um, but in terms of suspension, why is it? What's the scriptural basis? If you do not agree, if you do not um, come to a process of repentance uh, in relation to the admonition of the elders, why do we go to that next step of censure? Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. And, and all of this is going to come back to uh, this business about an unbeliever leaving a marriage. We're going to circle back to that in just a moment. That's why we're taking the time to do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what Paul says about the Lord's Supper here. Beginning with verse 14. Beloved ones, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I'm saying. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. What do I imply then, that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I simply I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now this whole uh, business here about idolatry is in the context of the whole chapter and it relates to um, their sexual behavior and he relates the Corinthian church to the wilderness community and how remember how they made an idol with the golden calf and they were involved in sexual play is what Exodus says right and so Paul picks up on that and then he warns them about their idolatry, about their immorality, uh, and the fact that they're continuing to eat the Lord's Supper. Notice what he says in chapter, uh, chapter 11. He says, but in the uh, following instructions, I do not commend you, verse 17, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. In the first place, when you come together as church, there are divisions among you. I believe it. There must be factions in order that you who are genuine might be recognized. When you come together, it's not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you? No, I will not. And then he starts with the words of institution, but... Let's just move to uh, verse 27. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. And so the scriptural basis for the censure of suspension from the table is that we might examine ourselves right and discern the body discern what the gospel calls us to the kind of life the gospel calls us to of this of this exclusive loyalty to Jesus right and that whatever it is our immorality um, our desire to marry another person our adultery whatever it might be is idolatrous mm -hmm. right it's not after the Lordship of Christ. And so that's the second censure is suspension uh, from the Lord's table. There is the third censure and uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, if you just back up a little bit, we, we read about that. You remember that in the Old Testament there was capital punishment for several offenses where 
the power of the church and the power of the state were one. Um, there was the severe punishment for adultery of capital punishment. That's why when we read about David's adultery with Bathsheba, and he pleads with God in Psalm 51 to have mercy upon him, it's important for us to remember that David knows he's under a capital offense. He's committed a capital offense in terms of, of uh, the way he's treated uh, Bathsheba's husband, exposed him to death, and the way he treated Bathsheba, and the Lord has mercy on him. In the New Testament, those capital offenses that we read about in the Old Testament are translated in the New Covenant because now the church and state are not together, but God has an international, intercultural people distributed. His kingdom is distributed throughout all the nations of the earth, right? So these capital offenses then attract uh, the censure of excommunication. So notice what we see in terms of uh, chapter 5. It's reported there is sexual immorality among you, verse 1, of a kind not even tolerated among the pagans, that a man has his father's wife, his stepmother. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who's done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in the spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He goes on and then notice what he says in verse 8. Let us celebrate the festival, Passover, Christ is our Passover, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and uh, truth. So, uh, we see a couple of things in 1 Corinthians 5. One is Paul is rebuking them for not shepherding, for not having a discipline process, for not um, protecting the integrity of the gospel and what the body of Christ is to represent in the world in terms of its sincerity uh, and truth. And he says that the <coughs> sanction for this man is to put him outside the church. But notice something, and here's where I think a lot of us struggle and there's some confusion, is that by putting someone outside of the church, and we saw this in Matthew 18, it's the same principle. What did it say at the end of Matthew 18? Treat them as if they're a Gentile, right? As if an unbeliever, right? And so there's a recognition that someone who had professed faith is not acting like a believer. Now, I do that every day. I act like an unbeliever every day, right? But the thing is that they persist in it. As they're confronted by the gospel, as they're shepherded, is there's a persisting in evil, right? And so there's a sanction, there's a patient process. It takes a long time. We shouldn't be quick to move through this process. But brothers and sisters, neither should we be really, really, really slow either. We should move along through the process because sin just continues to deceive us and to seep in and to harden our hearts. So we need to keep, keep at it <coughs> in the discipline process, just like we do with our kids, right? Same in the church. That's the model back and forth. But notice what we see here is that both in Matthew 18 and in 1 Corinthians 5, we don't know their hearts. Even if we discipline and put people out of the church, we don't know their hearts. Right? We don't know if they're a believer for sure or an unbeliever for sure because what we hope for, what's the purpose of discipline? Restoration, repentance, Reclaim your brother, Matthew 18, right? And in fact, if you turn with me over to 2 Corinthians just for a minute, that's the good news about this guy. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 5. 
Well, let's start with verse 6. For such a one, this punishment by, but by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you, reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you're obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for the sake, for your sake, in the presence of Christ. So most scholars believe that what Paul is referring to in 2 Corinthians 2 is the same man, the same case he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. In that situation, discipline worked. The brother was seeking forgiveness. He was owning up to his sin. He wanted again to experience the gospel. And Paul says, receive him, forgive him, comfort him. Right? That's the goal, is that restoration, which we see here at the end. So this is the process that the scriptures outline for us. Positive discipline, just like in our families, in terms of instruction and example. But then also negative discipline of censure in terms of admonishment, suspension, even to the point of excommunication, but all for the goal of uh, restoration. Now, why is this important? One reason this is so important is if we go back to 1 Corinthians 7, I have a question about verse... 15, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Someone who professes to be a Christian persists in patterns that are undermining their marriage, in infidelity, or just leaving. What happens to that other partner? What sort of remedy do they have? How can they go forward with their life? If the church is involved in a discipline process and the person who is calling themselves a believer but persists in acting as an unbeliever, right, then they can be recognized that that action is the action of an unbeliever. And then that would make it possible for the other person, the offended party then, to be able to go on with their life, to be free, to remarry. But if the church is not involved, right, then it makes it very, very difficult for that believer to know, am I free to remarry or not? Even though they've been offended, even though their covenant has been ruptured, right? How do they, how do they understand where they stand in relation to the Lord? Perhaps even more importantly, how do the children of that marriage understand what has happened in their parents' marriage? If the church hasn't been involved in shepherding. How do they know what the Lord thinks about what marriage is, about what marriage is supposed to be? Unless, because the family has failed, but the church, the household of God, the family of God, if they're involved, then they have a chance of understanding what marriage is supposed to be about. They have a chance of sorting out what really happened between their parents, because it's not just mom's word against dad's word, right? So brothers and sisters, I just want to say the discipline process is such an important process. It's costly. But I think if we can raise up leaders in sheep pens where people can be known, where the sheep can be know the voice of the one who comes to discipline them, we'll have all this capital then to make it, make it more likely that the discipline will be successful. Well, I want to close tonight in terms of some possible resources. Um, I looked online, and there, is, there are some divorce care groups in New Zealand. Uh, divorce care is used by lots of different kinds of churches. And let me just say that um, Darlene has participated in what, two different groups. Is that right? And I, I participated in one group, and it really depends on the strength of the leaders, just like everything else, right? The materials are good, but it really depends on the strength and training of the leaders as far as 
uh, those relationships with the people in the group. I can say my colleague Bob Burns, uh, who was with me at Covenant Seminary, he and Tom Whiteman uh, wrote this book about 20 years ago, the Fresh Start Divorce Recovery Workbook. Uh, you can get that through Amazon here, and it is an excellent resource. The Fresh Start Ministry, they don't do conferences here in New Zealand, but the workbook it would be a valuable resource, I think, for elders, for women shepherds in women's groups. And let me just sort of go back then to one last point about the discipline process. One of the things that I've seen time and time again is that um, when it gets to the point of censure, oftentimes the woman is asked to come to a session meeting to meet sort of behind closed doors with just the male elders because we believe rightly that the scripture teaches that the office of, of elder is only for qualified men. But what I've seen happen is if the elders have structured shepherding to where women shepherds and small group leaders are walking through the whole process and then those elders invite those women leaders who have walked with these women in the stress of their marriage, in the breakdown of their marriage, invite them into those meetings where they're considering the situation, they're hearing her story, not just her voice alone sitting before this council of men, but with the other women who have walked with her, even if it's one or two other women, oh, it's got a much greater chance of succeeding, of her actually staying with the process. And so I just want to encourage us as elders, just like we wouldn't establish parenting po uh, policies by ourselves um, in our household, as we establish shepherding uh, policies in our church and structures in our church, we should do it in close consultation with the godly gifted women who have discernment, who are mothering the younger women in the church. We should do it in close consultation with them. It's not enough just to talk to our wives and think that we know the mind of the women of the church. It's important to talk to our wives they're valuable counselors for us. But God has gifted women who are the prayer warriors of the church, who are the, the ones who mother the younger women in the church, like Timothy told them to, and Titus told them to, right? So how do we integrate those women disciplers, those women leaders, into the shepherding process, into the discipline process? They're not the ones voting. They're not the ones deciding. But boy, we need their counsel. Boy, we need their presence, right? Boy, we need the social capital that they have that will make it all the more possible for that process to succeed and for it to reach its, its goal, which is restoration. Well, finally, I have, um, I want to say something about ministering to children during marital crisis. A brief word. Do it. <laughs> a brief word. Do it. Uh, make safe places. Give permission for kids to talk. Uh, keep confidences with them. Um, you know, we're Presbyterians, most of us here tonight, and we took vows when these kids were baptized. Vows that we would support and encourage their parents and we would support their parents in raising them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And baptismal vows are serious business. Peter said that these promises, right, that I'm preaching about are for you and for your children uh, and for everyone who's far off, right? And um, Jesus said that to cause one of these little ones to sin It'd be better for us to have a millstone wrapped around our neck and to be thrown into the depths, right? In Matthew 18. And then right after that, he says, uh, the, the disciples want to keep the kids away from Jesus to protect him from them, right? He says, let the children come to me. One of the things that just breaks my heart um, as a dad 
is that my kids weren't seen in this process. My former wife and I were attended to. People paid attention to us. But my kids didn't have a place to talk. All they really had to go on was what mom might say or what dad might say, right? And I was trying not to say very much in terms of I didn't want to undermine their relationship with their mother, right? But the kids in the, in the middle, that's the name of a program in St. Louis. It's a very effective program. It's called Kids in the Middle, where kids can go with other teenagers, other kids their age, maybe they're 10 to 12, maybe they're preteens, and they get in these groups and they're able to talk about their experience. What's going on at school? What's going on at home? Um, that they're scared. That they don't understand what's going on. There's a study um, that a woman did in a hospital ward with children who had leukemia. And she was observing sort of the patterns, the sociological patterns, of how the parents and the doctors and the nurses were conspiring to protect the children from the news that they had a deadly disease. Well, the children actually knew that they had a deadly disease. And then the children had the additional weight of having to play the game, having to protect mom and dad and having to protect the doctors and having to sort of play along. And it created sort of this this additional layer of weight and stress. I believe that often happens in the church when it comes to marital stress and divorce. We feel like we have to protect the kids so we don't talk about it. We don't talk about what's really going on. And so for our children's leaders and our youth leaders, I think the most important thing we can train them to do is be present. Go pick up the kid from school or after school and take him for a Coke or a milkshake or go to the park with him or uh, give him a ride or to youth group. Make yourself available and just open yourself to listen about what's going on. Create safe places for the kids to talk. I know things are tough at home right now. How are you feeling about that? So tell me more about that. Um, I think it's so important that we're intentional about ministering to children. There's a resource uh, here in New Zealand that's, no, actually it's not here in New Zealand, but this um, here is a resource where it's online. It's available online. So you'd have access to the materials. It's not a church-run thing, but there's some really good things here. It's called the Center for Divorce Education. And there's a section here on learning about children in between. And this is the place where the Kids in the Middle program got its start, is they took their materials uh, and they started setting up some of these kids groups. And now in St. Louis, the family courts actually refer to the Kids in the Middle program. So if you look online, it's, uh, it's in the notes there. There's a number of issues that, uh, that they address in there, like one parent talking bad about the other parent, or about one parent sending messages through the kids to the other parent. These are very common issues in terms of marital stress and divorce, and they have some materials there where children's ministry leaders, youth ministry leaders uh, can be informed. Uh, on how to negotiate those things with the kids when the kids are talking about these kinds of things. All right? So I just want to say that in the shepherding process, we can focus on the marital partners who are in distress and fail to look at the kids, and we really need to, to keep the kids in mind, the whole family system in mind. I want to stop there and just sort of open it up if you have a question or two. I know we're at the end of time and I'm very humble that you would come out three nights in a row. It's a, such a huge commitment. I know many of you got child care for these nights. So I just want to thank you um, for your 
commitment to this important topic. Any closing comments or questions about the discipline process or about the shepherding process that piqued your interest tonight? I agree. Let's go home. (coughs) All right. Let's pray together. Lord, I know that even here tonight, there are hearts in pain. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you love your sheep and that you are the good shepherd and you go after us. I thank you that you promised that to Israel in Ezekiel 34 and that in your son you made good on that promise that you would come yourself to be our shepherd. And Lord, as you've raised up under shepherds, I just thank you for the men in this room who are elders of the church. I thank you for their wives and their families and their gifts of hospitality and their sacrifices to give of their time and of their love uh, to your sheep who are growing, to your sheep who are hurting. So Lord, I just ask that you would energize them by your spirit, that you would encourage their hearts, open their eyes to the fruit that you're producing among your people. And yet, Lord, in those areas where we have room to grow as shepherds, in creating safe places and pointing out pathways. Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom, ways of including women shepherds and small group leaders more in the process of discerning what what you're up to with those who are hurting, those who are sinning, those who are running. Lord, I thank you for how you love us, that you pursue your bride for the sake of restoration, to bring us back to yourself, that there might be a celebration in heaven over repentance and fruit. So Lord, go with us now as we go back to our homes and to our children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Saturday afternoon is a, a seminar for women on loneliness that Sally uh, Terry is going to be conducting. And the information is two bits of paper available for you on the way out to spread like confetti among your friends. And, uh, if you uh, also up there on the table as you go out, there's all the handouts from the last three sessions. If you've missed out on any of them, uh, they're up there so you can have a uh, complete set. Thank you very much for coming out.